Wow. Um, Camilla, uh, thank you very much for uh, the introduction, a very kind introduction. And I uh, just want to say that I'm absolutely thrilled um, and overwhelmed uh, to be here at, at uh, Texas Heart to give Grand Rounds today. Um, what I'm going to talk about today, and I, um, I really like this, this audience and this atmosphere. It seems very casual and intimate, so I'm not going to be extremely formal and nervous in, in giving this talk to this audience today. But what I'm going to be talking about is um, work that I've been doing probably for about the past eight years. It doesn't seem like it's been that long, um, but it, it definitely has. So my talk today is going to focus around what I feel are the four pillars required for successful gene therapy. And the example that I'm giving today is around cardiac transplantation because that's near and dear to my heart. There are four um, pillars um, are the delivery approach, and I'm going to focus in on what we've been using in regards to normal thermic ex vivo perfusion. And then another important component is the vector design, including the capsids. And this research um, that I'm going to talk about involves my experiences with adenoviral vectors as well as adeno-associated viral vectors. And really the delivery approach and the vector design, those two components go hand in hand. So I'm going to be um, talking about those uh, together. And then the next two pillars are the disease model and the therapeutic target. And, and those also go really uh, hand in hand. The disease model that we've been working to develop is a model in the pig for acute rejection for cardiac transplantation. And the therapeutic target, obviously, um, or what you're actually putting into the viral vector, the, the genetic information that you put into the viral back vector, really depends on the application. And while there are um, a lot of applications for gene therapy for cardiac transplantation, what we're focusing on right now is um, trying to minimize the need for chronic immunosuppressive drugs. So I'm gonna kind of take you step-by-step step through our journey um, that's still ongoing to uh, bring this to a reality. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about is the delivery approach of normothermic ex vivo perfusion. But before I get to that, I really need to talk a little bit about the evolution of cardiac preservation. And until not too long ago, the way that hearts were stored, donor hearts were stored, um, was that a heart was acquired from a brain dead donor. Um, it was arrested with cold cardioplegia. It was, um, it was washed out, rinsed out, and then placed in a bag of preservation solution and stuck into um, an ice cooler. And this really um, was very limiting. It limited the time out, um, the heart could be out of the, the donor. It limited the travel distance as well as limited organ allocation. Quite recently, um, there has been an evolution um, in the use of uh, ex vivo perfusion. And for the heart, it has been um, primarily um, uh, uh, represented by the um, transmedics organ care system, which is shown right here. And this is normothermic ex vivo perfusion. It's an FDA approved device. And it really has enabled um, an expansion of organ allocation because the heart can spend eight or more hours outside of the body um, before it's transplanted. And it, that obviously extends uh, the distance that uh, the procurement team can, can travel in the distance uh, where the, the organ can come from. What um, this device has done, in addition, it has um, enabled the utilization or the transplantation of previously unusable um, hearts. And in 2019, doctors at Duke performed the first donation after circulatory death heart transplant in the U.S., and it, this was uh, utilized uh, utilizing the transmedics OCS system. And this has essentially expanded the donor pool by as much as 30%. What we want to do and what we want to use uh, normothermic ex vivo machine perfusion for is to further um, um, improve uh, cardiac transplantation uh, by gene therapy. 
And how does, how does this uh, normal thermic ex vivo machine perfusion um, enable gene th delivery? Well, it um, maintains the donor heart in a near um, physiological beating state. It's not in working mode, but the heart, um, the heart is beating. Um, there's a perfusate, which consists of donor blood. It's supplemented with nutrients in a, a proprietary uh, preservation solution or perfusate. There's also oxygen that's provided, and this is all in a very controlled and, and protected environment um, that you know, mimics um, as closely as possible a living system. And these traits, um, in addition, um, there's a continual um, pass of a vector, a viral vector within a circuit. And what this does is it maximizes opportunities for vector attachment and entry, and also for um, the transduction process to proceed. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so let me uh, switch gears and introduce a little bit about some of the viral vectors that I'm gonna be talking about. Um, my experiences uh, in this system, involve two vector types. One is an adenoviral vector and the other one is an adeno-associated viral vector. Um, they're very uh, distinct biological entities. Adenoviral vectors are much larger than adeno-associated viral vectors, about uh, five times larger. Um, they, uh, the uh, DNA or is, uh, in an adenoviral vector is double-stranded and an adeno-associated virus is, is single-stranded. Some of the interesting properties of uh, these vectors have to do with onset of expression. Um, adenoviral vectors provide a very quick um, and very robust um, gene expression in um, different experimental situations. However, there is a, a very robust immune, system, immune response to, to these vectors. On the other hand, adeno-associated viral vectors um, they're more stealthy. Um, they are um, slower in terms of uh, gene expression. It takes two weeks, if not longer, um, for maximal gene expression to emerge from these vectors. But they, they elicit a much lower um, immune response uh, to the vector particles um, than an adenoviral vector uh, does. Um, considering though it's very small, it does have uh, a limited uh, packaging capacity, but all in all, um, adeno-associated viral vectors are at, at this moment really the most uh, clinically relevant uh, vector. Um, there are five uh, FDA approved uh, products now uh, utilizing adeno-associated viral vector for, for gene therapies, mostly of, of rare diseases. Before um, we started doing experiments uh, to evaluate the ability of these different vectors to uh, be utilized in an ex vivo uh, perfusion system, we did some preliminary work trying to understand whether or not some of the components of the OCS system would have any kind of influence on both the ADD and the AAV vectors. And we did a lot of this work in variety of uh, cells. And what we found in these uh, early studies was that um, while the proprietary uh, perfusate that's mixed with the blood was not, um, did not really influence the transduction of uh, ad viruses in cell culture experiments, what we did find was that blood components um, negatively impacted the ability of the uh, ad to transduce um, to, to transduce cells. So we wanted to devise strategies to eliminate uh, presumably neutralizing antibodies in 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 the blood. Um, and so this is uh, shown here um, in this publication in uh, 2019. And this is our first foray into utilizing the normal thermic ex vivo um, system from Transmedics. Um, uh, shown here are the key individuals that are, were involved in the study. Uh, Carmelo Milano, um, it's our lab basically. Carmelo and I um, are, are the, are the co-PIs uh, um, on, this, on this study. 
And we had a very talented surgical resident, Moaz Bashali, who uh, spearheaded this study, as well as uh, Jen Ning Ron, an uh, attending cardiothoracic surgeon from Taiwan. And in this study, um, in this publication, what we did was we used an adenovirus. It was um, an ad, very simple, first generation adenovirus. And um, we used the luciferase reporter transgene um, under the control of the CMV promoter. So we were, um, we were kind of going, we were going for the gusto on, um, on, on this using this, this factor. Um, what we uh, used was a, a, a pig model, a pig heterotopic heart transplant model. In these studies, we're, we use the, um, the Yorkshire, the pink um, pigs. Um, later on, I'm going to talk about our work that we've been doing in, in the Yucatan model. What, um, what we did here is that the donor pig, the, um, the, the donor heart was removed as well as um, the donor blood. And then we utilized a, a cell saver um, and washed the blood uh, prior to putting it onto the OCS device. And this was to eliminate um, whatever uh, plasma factors, serum factors were uh, inhibiting uh, the vector. And then um, we, uh, in this study, we actually put the viral vector onto the circuit before we, um, we, we hung the heart. Um, we've since changed that, um, but uh, 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 that detail is uh, uh, just an interesting detail here. Um, and then we, we hung the heart on the, um, the OCS device and then perfused the heart with the vector for two um, hours. And then um, what we saw in this study was uh, very promising. Uh, first of all, because there was a very uh, quick onset of gene expression with adenovirus, we didn't need to survive the animals for a very long time period in order to see if this worked or not. We survived the animals for, for five days. And also um, in this particular study, we did not use any form of immunosuppression because um, it really, it really wasn't um, required. The um, results were very, very nice, very exciting for us. What we saw was a very robust and diffuse luciferase um, activity and expression in the donor heart. Wherever we looked, wherever we biopsied, wherever we assessed, we saw um, extremely high expression. And importantly, we saw no evidence of luciferase protein or gene expression anywhere else in the recipient animal. Um, so we were very, uh, very, very excited about, about these results. So um, we switched then to trying to evaluate uh, the more clinically relevant virus that offers a more durable uh, gene expression. And so I just want to go over a little bit kind of the history of uh, AAV um, and, 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 you know, what makes it, um, what converted it from almost a virus into um, what I'm going to show you next is an, an awesome virus. So AAVs were discovered, um, gosh, a long time ago, uh, before I was born. Um, but uh, in a uh, contaminant in an in adenoviral prep. And for a long time, you know, people considered it almost a virus because it really is one of the smallest viruses that have ever been described. It's um, very, very um, uh, non-complicated. It's very simple in structure. Uh, there's a, a capsid shell. Um, it has a um, icosah icosahedral symmetry of 60 uh, capsid subunits. And it contains a single-stranded viral DNA, and it's very, very small. Um, they're very, it's 4.7 kilobases in size, and there's uh, very few genetic, genetic elements. There's this inverted terminal repeats, and then there are two genes that encode about seven or eight proteins. It's a member of the parvovirus family, and it's a subfamily of the dependoviruses. And, and what that means is that um, because it's so small, it doesn't carry with it um, the genes that's required for its own replication. It requires uh, help from other viruses such as adenovirus. But one of the really um, critical things about this virus, it's so stealthy, 
um, that there's been no reports of any pathology caused by viral infections with, with, this vi with this virus, and there's no associated diseases. And so that's uh, the primary criteria um, that my, my mentor, uh, my uh, postdoc mentor, Jude Samalski in, um, in the 1980s uh, realized um, that this would be a, a very phenomenal and aw awesome virus to um, utilize uh, in gene therapy. And what, uh, what, what Jude um, found was that these inverted terminal repeats were really the only thing that were required of the vector um, to package any genetic material into an AV capsid. So essentially he, he discovered the key of how to vectorize um, an AV. And this has led to quite recently um, FDA approval for multiple uh, gene therapy indications. Again, it's got a, a safer clinical profile than ADD um, and a uh, very nice property is this ability to confer long-term gene expression. Obviously, one of the constraints is, um, is this limited packaging size. And um, uh, what I'm gonna talk about later is using vectors uh, with, with ex vivo perfusion. This really doesn't matter. Um, you can um, get around some of this packaging limitation if you wanna provide multiple genes uh, by providing cocktails of, uh, of uh, viral vectors uh, with ex vivo perfusion. I spent a lot of time um, looking at different AV serotypes and understanding uh, the capsid, which is the part of the, the virus that uh, confers uh, tissue uh, transduction or tissue tropism. Um, and there's a lot of flavors. There's, uh, you know, there's 13, 14 different serotypes, naturally occurring serotypes. And there are thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions of different capsid variants that um, people have um, made over, over the years. Uh, very early on, some of my early work was actually um, looking at how you can modify individual um, individual new, um, amino acids uh, of the capsid and, and changing the tropism. And I've kind of, uh, I'm kind of done with that. Um, but uh, one of the uh, vectors that I was able to develop uh, led, I was used in a, a clinical trial for Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Um, but uh, additional work was, I was able to develop um, more cardiotropic capsids. Um, some with some very interesting properties that um, we've been able to take advantage of and using in, in the OCS system. Uh, one of the properties of one of the, the capsids that I designed actually has enhanced transduction in the presence of heparin, which is a component of the um, OCS system. So similar to what we did with the um, ad, uh, we did a series of cell-based studies to try to understand which of the AV serotypes or which of, or was the special capsid that I developed, um, which one would we use in um, our pig studies. Um, and we did a series of uh, studies in different cell lines with these different uh, AVs. And what we found um, was that the one I developed, uh, at least in cells, uh, work the best, but we also found um, that there were uh, components of the preservation solution, the perfusate from transmetics, that could enhance AV transduction across multiple cell lines. And we also discovered additional additives that could enhance AV transduction. And uh, this led to a patent application that we filed earlier this year. Uh, for the invention of perfuse A composition and methods for ex vivo delivery to organs. So uh, this kind of just summarizes, again, um, the blood components, the neutralizing antibodies, obviously we, um, uh, th those were inhibit inhibitory. So in all of our subsequent studies, we have included use of the cell saver. Um, and then this just lists some of the um, non-protected enhancing um, components that we, we discovered that were already in the OCS uh, perfuse. So this is a publication that came out earlier this year 
Um, and it was spearheaded by two very talented surgical residents in the lab, Yuting Chang and Michelle Mendiola Pla. Um, and this work was actually uh, started uh, before COVID and we had um, to shut down. Um, so uh, it took a while before, before we finished it. Um, but uh, essentially what we did in the study, instead of add, we used an AV. Um, again, it was a CMV luciferase. Uh, the donor heart was, um, was procured. It was um, placed on the OCS circuit. The donor blood was, was washed. Um, and then the viral vector was uh, uh, applied to the circuit uh, at the uh, aortic root. And then similarly, we allowed the preservation, uh, we, we allowed the the viral vector to perfuse for a two hour time period. And we've done some studies where we've taken um, aliquots of the perfusate um, off of, uh, you know, off, off every, every 10 or 15 minutes and we've done cell based studies. And what those studies have shown is that um, very quickly uh, the virus in the perfusate is going away. So presumably within at least uh, 30 minutes the majority of, of the viral vector is is gone, um, and we believe that it's uh, been it's a, it's um, trafficking. It's it's a, it's attached um, and it's entering uh, cardiac cells. Um, while the um, while the heart uh, is on the OCS, uh, again, we think there's receptor uh, binding that's happening because this is normal thermic conditions. We believe that there's an internalization process happening. And then um, the other parts of the viral uh, vector lifestyle, life cycle, the um, single-stranded encoding, conversion uh, to double-stranded DNA, the RNA transcription, the translation, and the protein, all of that's happening um, once the uh, heart is implanted into the recipient animal. And in this study, um, we survived these animals out longer. We survived them uh, for for 30 days instead of five days. Um, these animals were um, on immunosuppression. They were on uh, they were on cyclosporine. We we were not matching these animals. Uh, they were only uh, from the same uh, litter, um, but uh, it that 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 worked out well for us. And what we saw in this study with AV was very robust and very durable. Uh, gene expression. This was a, a dose uh, response study. We, um, we did a series of three animals, each with an increasing amount of viral vector. Um, and you can see um, that uh, this is looking at luciferase uh, expression. Um, and you can see um, an increasing uh, a trend as the, the viral vector um, uh, was increased. Um, you can see also, um, you only have uh, evidence of luciferase activity in the transplanted heart um, and no, uh, no evidence of any kind of activity in the native heart. And then also um, this uh, immunostaining with luciferase antibodies in A and C, you see extremely high levels of luciferase protein in the donor heart and in B and D, no evidence of luciferase protein in the native heart. Similarly, um, when we looked at uh, DNA from the AAV, we only saw, and this is at 30 days, we only saw um, evidence of DNA in the uh, allograft, and uh, we saw no DNA in the native hearts or uh, in the liver. There was also no evidence of any allograft injury or any off-target expression. And um, this is looking at uh, other, other organs like liver, lung, um, and uh, looking at the uh, protein or at uh, the DNA. So summarizing our experiences with ex vivo perfusion, um, we have shown that vectors based on AV and AD can be provided to the heart in, this, uh, in a very efficient manner. Uh, we have an understanding that um, uh, the blood um, is something that we would uh, we would like to uh, wash to eliminate uh, any any um, 
any um, interference with the viral vector transduction while on the OCS. We found that some components of the perfusate um, do enhance AV transduction when working to uh, better um, or to improve uh, perf the perfusate specific for this application. Um, one of the, um, uh, one of the uh, reasons um, of, of washing the blood also is um, that it circumvent, circumvents this neutralizing antibody uh, issues uh, with a systemic vector delivery. I mean, there's no need to screen um, the gene therapy recipients. We found that the gene expression was uh, pretty much everywhere in the heart, in the, in the donor heart. And um, it's um, very uh, much uh, uh, compared to other methods like intramuscular delivery or IV delivery or intracoronary delivery or delivery while um, an animal um, is on cardiopulmonary bypass. Um, this delivery method just really um, uh, outperforms all of these other delivery methods. Um, again, um, and very importantly, from a safety standpoint, we only saw uh, vector DNA and vector uh, derived protein in the heart. Um, we did not see it anywhere else um, in, in the body of the animal. And then, as I mentioned before, um, you can really, there, there's this, there doesn't seem to be really any, any limit of uh, the amount of vector uh, that we can provide um, in an ex vivo situation. So you can envision that there could be cocktails of multiple vectors that could be provided uh, simultaneously targeting different cell types um, in the heart, as well as targeting multiple pathways in the heart. Um, what are we doing right now? Uh, two days ago, we did an, um, we started another series of studies um, where we really want to, we have another candidate um, AV capsid, and uh, we really want to have an understanding of what's the best capsid that we want to use before we proceed to do uh, therapeutic work. And so uh, we're doing a series of, of three heterotopic transplants. Um, we are uh, using Yucatans, and um, we are syngenetically matching, matching these animals. We're doing a very similar experiment with a few different changes. Um, we are going to be providing immunosuppression, um, tacrolimus, uh, and this is a part of our model that I'll talk about um, in, in subsequent slides. Um, another thing that we're doing in this study is that we're surviving the animals for 90 days because we really want to get an understanding of uh, the durability of uh, the AV expression in this system because really nobody's done this before. Um, another thing that uh, we're doing uh, is that we've established an uh, endomyocardial uh, biopsy approach uh, from a heterotopic uh, heart transplant for heterotopic heart transplants. And so we're going to be doing uh, EMBs uh, once per month so that we can get a better understanding of the um, onset uh, of, of gene expression. And, um, um, and uh, we're also including uh, uh, MRIs uh, preoperatively and, and postoperatively in, in this study. Not just this animal's doing uh, extremely well, uh, knock on wood. Um, and we have uh, another one uh, in January and February. So now that we um, have demonstrated that we can um, very efficiently transduce a donor heart using uh, ex vivo perfusion, what are the potential applications of this, of this technology, of, of this approach? The lowest hanging fruit and the, the fruit that we're going after right now is um, improving uh, cardiac allograft outcomes. Um, and there's a, a lot of different things that you can, you can do. Um, you can imagine um, providing protective genes um, to counter you know, rejection, and, that, and that's what we're focusing on right now. Um, but there's uh, you know, ischemic reperfusion injury, 
Um, there's a uh, cardiac allograft vasculopathy. Um, there's, um, you know, even potential ways of uh, increasing the, the longevity of, um, uh, of uh, the, the, the heart. So that's, uh, you know, what, what we're uh, focusing on at this moment, but there's uh, uh, three other things that um, this could be very useful for. One um, involves a xeno, xenotransplantation, and everybody knows um, of the, the two, um, the two xenotransplant um, heart patients that um, uh, were transplanted with these genetically uh, modified pigs, and you can only modify you know, pigs so much. So you can imagine that we could use um, this ex vivo gene delivery to further modify these, these donor pig hearts. Um, another uh, kind of uh, kind of moonshot um, involves auto transplantation, um, and can we um, treat advanced heart failure um, by taking out uh, a heart and providing it with a very very effectively providing it with um, a therapeutic transgene and um, putting that heart back into a patient. Um, it's uh, you know, it, it, we've shown that uh, it, the gene expression only um, emerges, uh, is only evident in, in, um, in, uh, in the donor heart. And then some other long-term applications could involve organ banking and, and organ uh, reconditioning. So that um, brings me to uh, what we're trying to work on right now which is to um, minimize the need for uh, chronic immunosuppressive drugs. And before we do that, we really, need, we really needed a, a preclinical model, a large animal preclinical model, which was compatible with the OCS system. And there are um, non-human primate models, um, but they're small. Um, the hearts are small, and from a size perspective, um, we really, we really didn't want to go there, and all of our our work is uh, is uh, been done in the pig so far. So this is work that was um, spearheaded by Michelle Mendiola Pla over the past uh, three or four years. Um, it kind of got impacted as well um, by COVID, but uh, we're we're near the end uh, of this. And um, what Michelle did was uh, she used a Yucatan model. And these were fully mismatched uh, swine leukocyte antigen mismatched animals. And um, uh, we did, again, heterotopic heart transplant. Um, we utilized immunosuppression for a 14 day period. And then we removed the immunosuppression and then observed these animals for, um, uh, for development of rejection. And we observed these animals in, in many different ways, and we had to develop uh, some of this technology and some of these methods, um, including, um, uh, and I'll, I'll get to this, but we, we drew blood and monitored for different biomarkers, um, MRI, um, histology, echoes, um, and uh, uh, endomyocardial biopsies. And um, we um, found that the heart went from a, a nice looking heart to this really uh, ragged looking uh, rejected uh, heart. So um, these are just some of the components of, of our, our model. Again, um, we used uh, mismatched animals, fully, fully mismatched animals. And we were, what we're trying to do uh, to achieve was a, a controlled acute rejection. And there were a lot of uh, different components to this. Um, but just a little background, the SLE system um, is a very uh, well-characterized um, MHC system. The genomic organization is a little bit different uh, from that of the HLA class one. Um, they're orthologs, they're not, they're not homologs. And um, luckily enough, we um, aligned with uh, the world's expert on SLA uh, genotyping, uh, Sam Ho at uh, the Gift of Hope. And for our studies, um, we go to the vendor, we get about 20 or uh, 40 animals to screen. We get blood from those animals. We send it to Sam and, and Lyndon and they do uh, the genotyping with their proprietary primers. And uh, then they return something that looks like this to us. And so 
Um, from this matrix, we uh, determine uh, which are the donors and which are the recipients, and um, we, we, go, we go from there. I have to say, screening about, these are very inbred animals, and um, from screening about 20 animals, we're lucky if we get uh, two pairs of mismatched animals. So uh, it's, it's, it can be uh, quite tedious and, and, and quite expensive. Although one of the good things is that we don't have to screen for neutralizing antibody. So that, that's, that's a, a blessing in that regard. So this is the immune suppression schedule that um, we worked out over a period of time. And what it consists of is methylprednisolone. It's a, a, a taper. Um, MMF, and then uh, tacrolimus for 14 days uh, post-transplant. And we start the TAC injections uh, three days prior to injection. And what we aim for is a, a target trough in the pigs um, between 5 and 15 nanograms per mil. And we found that this was actually uh, really critical to get in this, um, in this trough range because if we had one animal that um, really um, uh, was just was way over the, the, the therapeutic level and that animal never rejected. And then for reasons we don't understand, um, uh, it might've had something to do with the, the particular metabolism of, of that pig. And then we had another pig where we were, um, it, was, it was below five uh, throughout that 14 time period and it rejected really quick. So we found that this really, this sweet spot was uh, between um, five and 15 uh, nanograms per mil in this 14 days. So then after um, 14 days, uh, we stopped the immunosuppression and then we, we monitor the graft. Um, and the other reason why we did this immunosuppression, remember I told you there's a, uh, it, it, it takes a while for AV expression to, to ramp up. Um, and so we were giving uh, the simunosuppression um, a chance, uh, and we were giving the AD, the AV vector a, a chance to start expressing the transgene um, before we, um, you know, bef before we, uh, we, we, we took that, uh, the immunosuppression off. So um, these are some of the things that are some of the, uh, the, the assessment modalities that we have been working on. And, and this is still a, a work in progress right now. Um, working with, um, with Dave Wendell, um, this is, we, we're using a clinical MRI imager. Um, we actually bring the pigs over um, to the human clinical facilities and uh, we've been doing a cardiac MRI. I'm not going to um, get into uh, the, the, the nitty gritty details of this, but uh, we, we, we have the sense that this is a, a modality that's uh, going to be very useful for us um, for monitoring the onset of rejection. Um, so this is just some, some images, and we, we have a, a, a paper that's um, in, in preparation on this right now. Um, we're also trying to develop... A, donor-derived cell-free DNA analysis, uh, taking a, uh, you know, a page out of the playbook from uh, what people uh, have been doing, researchers have been doing um, for um, human um, rejection. Um, looking for cell-free DNA. Um, we've, uh, working with geneticists at Duke, we've done whole genome sequencing on, on 12 pigs. And right now, um, we're trying to identify uh, novel SNP variants between donor and recipient so that we can develop a PCR-based pan uh, based panel so that we can um, have something in, in semi-real time to look at uh, the development of uh, cardiac uh, of, of, re of rejection. Another thing that we've done, and I uh, say we, this is done by uh, Marat Fudum, uh, interventional cardiologist at Duke, uh, and Carolyn Glass, a uh, cardiac um, pathologist at Duke. Um, we've been able to um, develop the technique of performing a transvenous endomyocardial biopsy for um, the uh, heterotopic heart uh, transplants that are uh, in the abdomen. And uh, we recently uh, published an article um, on this, and we can do this. Uh, we're very confident uh, and comfortable um, doing, doing this technique regularly, and we've, we're planning to do that um, in the animals that we have ongoing right now, as well as um, in, our, uh, in our rejection studies with the therapeutic. 
Um, Michelle spent a lot of time um, finding reagents to look at um, different immune cells. Um, you know, working in the pig is a little bit more difficult in finding reagents than um, working in non-human primates and humans, um, but um, she's been able to um, uh, find this. Um, and this, this rejection looks like a, a, a T cell infiltration um, in the tissue at the endpoint. And you can see it better here. This is a rejected donor heart um, compared to the recipient native heart. So this is definitely a, a T cell mediated uh, rejection that we're seeing here. Um, Michelle also spent a lot of time uh, developing uh, the immune profiling for uh, different uh, immune cells. Um, you know, not to get into this again, but again, it's a, you know, an increase in, uh, in, uh, in T cells as, uh, the rejection proceeds. So this is a summary of, uh, the, the outcomes. Um, and what we found, um, using, uh, this, this, um, we had to go through a few iterations, which, which are shown at the, the top and I'm not going to, in the interest of time, I'm not going to, um, get into all of that. Um, but uh, what we've shown is that um, if we use completely SLA mismatched animals, if we do immunosuppression for 14 days and then take them off, if we keep within this trough uh, a level of five to 15, um, we get a rejection, uh, a fulminate uh, rejection, which is a cessa cessation of motility of the heart. Um, that's uh, our, our judgment of uh, uh, complete rejection in two months, plus or minus uh, one month. So we think we're ready um, to go um, uh, with this model. Um, so the next question is, uh, what are we gonna package into uh, the viral vector? Um, I'm gonna just kind of skip this. Um, what's our therapeutic target? What's our therapeutic indication? And again, it's uh, we're gonna uh, min try to minimize the need for chronic immunosuppressive drugs. Um, so what are, what are we, what are we, you know, looking at, what are we focusing on? And, you know, we're looking at the literature, um, of, you know, how do tumors evade the immune system? Um, all of these, uh, you know, checkpoint inhibitors, uh, we're very much interested, um, in all, in all of this biology around here. Obviously I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a, um, um, a tumor uh, biologist. I'm not a cancer person. And, and we've teamed up with Zach Hartman at Duke, um, who is a, um, a cancer biologist. And he has a, a, a very nice model that we're using to um, determine uh, what our candidate molecules are um, for selection. And he's got this nice model um, where we take these um, uh, we develop lentiviral vectors that express these different candidate uh, molecules, and they are delivered into cancer cells. And then they're um, injected or implanted into um, a mouse. And then um, we evaluate whether or not these animals develop uh, tumors. And so um, if there's no tolerance, there's no tumor. If there's tolerance, there's a tumor. So that's uh, the first phase of the study. Um, the second phase of the study um, involves uh, transgenic animals. And we've been working in the uh, past couple of years developing um, some transgenic animals that are mice that we use in mouse heterotopic heart transplants um, to understand whether or not uh, this is gonna be uh, the appropriate target before we move it into um, the large animal studies. And so uh, the uh, transgenic um, mouse models are being led by uh, Chris Duan, a surgical resident in the lab, and Jingwei Chen, um, he is an attending uh, CT surgeon um, from Taiwan. Um, so we're, we're here right now. Um, and this is what we've been focusing on um, is uh, PDL1. And uh, we're looking at a few different versions of PDL1. Um, this is some results from uh, Zach's model. Um, just to um, have us uh, focus better, you can see that uh, these different versions, uh, the transmembrane and the secreted forms of PDL1. Um, developed uh, tumors in three or four out of the five animals um, that were um, that were tested in this model, and we're using this model to evaluate um, a large number of um, of, uh, of of candidate targets. 
So what are we doing? Um, I'm just going to quickly go through this. We have a, um, a, a, a heterotopic mouse model um, that we use in the lab. Um, and you can, uh, what we're doing is, uh, at least initially, um, we're utilizing uh, transgenic animals, taking out the hearts, and then implanting them into the recipient, uh, into the recipient animals. We're monitoring um, the heart by physical palpations on a daily basis, um, as well as echo uh, cardiograms. And that's what we're doing, at least uh, um, right now. Um, this is just uh, um, from the Department of Surgery, so I have to show you know, uh, beating hearts uh, from a surgical procedure. Um, but um, this is just uh, some early work we did. Um, the model is, um, you know, BALBC to BLACK6, um, but uh, um, we, uh, so depending, because of the way the transgenic animals were, were generated in the strains, um, we were uncertain as to whether we could flip uh, the orientation and have you know, the recipients uh, be biopsy or black six. So we did a series of studies uh, looking if the direction of the mismatch mattered and, and no, it didn't. Um, this was uh, showing that this is a, 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 a T cell. Uh, this is a, you know, a, a, re a rejection from histology. Um, we uh, recently have gotten um, these transgenic animals um, the serum soluble and uh, the transmembrane animals. And also we did also get full length as well. I um, mean, this is just some very early data looking at graph survival of these different uh, transgenic animals. Um, Chris sent me this, uh, this, this, this data last night. Um, and we seem to have um, a, a promising signal right now in terms of survival of the graft. Uh, with the um, with the serum soluble as well as with the um, with the full length, and this is still um, ongoing work, and we're obviously um, needing to add uh, more animals to this. But um, you know, this is giving us some um, important information as to the target um, before we move into the um, into the pig model. Um, the other thing is that we can't make. Um, we can't make uh, transgenic animals for everything. It just takes too much time and it's just too costly and you can't make you know, transgenics for everything. Um, so we're also developing methods to uh, utilize uh, viral vectors that have our targets and, and evaluate this in, um, in, a, in, in, in a mouse model, a mouse heterotopic uh, model. And this is just showing um, some work where we can take an AUV with luciferase uh, and provide it uh, retroorbitally and a, a significant amount of that vector does uh, go to the heart. And then we can take those hearts out and we can do heterotopic heart transplants. And then you can see the glowing heart. Um, this is an in vivo imaging system. I um, mean, you can see the, um, the glowing hearts uh, in the abdomen of these animals. So um, we have uh, you know, some um, ongoing work right now with some targets that we have with, um, uh, with, with different viral vectors. Um, this is, uh, it's, it's embargoed right now, um, it's pr you know, proprietary as to uh, what these are, um, but these, these, these are ongoing. Um, and as soon as, we, um, as soon as we figure out what um, molecule uh, we want to utilize, um, we want to then go into our um, pig rejection model, um, which is uh, hopefully um, to begin in 2024. Um, probably we're looking um, at timelines uh, more in the fall of 2024 before we can begin these studies. And um, I had some other, um, well, um, this is uh, once we, this is our goal. I mean, once we have a reasonable therapeutic vector design, uh, we want to prevent the heart, um, this nasty looking heart. Um, we want it to look like this, uh, this, this pretty um, freshly implanted heart. Um, and then I, I think I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm just going to skip all over this. Um, there's been some, uh, we've been developing the literature on uh, gene therapy for cardiac transplantation. And I uh, just would uh, like to acknowledge uh, everybody is taken, you know, it takes a village. Uh, it's a huge team of people, um, you know, doing um, a whole lot of work and uh, very uh, grateful for uh, working with uh, Carmelo um, on this on this project, and uh, I greatly appreciate your time and um, thank you so much for this invitation to uh, talk about our work. And uh, I'm sorry if I 
went over a little bit. I don't think I have, I think I'm almost on time. And any questions I'm happy if I can answer.